Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Brian, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, this is a one hour speaker meeting that meets every Saturday right here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church. That's 301 North Main Street in Doylestown, PA. The food and the fellowship for this group starts at 8 o'clock and the speaker comes on at 8.30. The business meeting for this group meets every Saturday, 7 p.m. to 7.30, so feel free to come early and join us. Enjoy the refreshments we put out. If you want to get involved in service with this group, you're always looking for new members. Uh, the purpose of this group is to provide a consistent message of hope and recovery through God reliance and service to others through the practice and teaching of the 12 steps. We record all speakers so that others can benefit from their message of recovery. If you wish not to be recorded, simply ask. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. The group would like to welcome everyone, especially newcomers. So if there's anybody new at this meeting for the first time or visiting from out of town that would like to introduce themselves on a first name basis, we can welcome you. Yeah. Nice. Welcome, welcome. That's it, we got everybody? Okay, nice. Um, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group encourages sponsorship. Would anyone with a working knowledge of the 12 steps and who is willing to sponsor please raise your hands? So we got plenty of people willing to sponsor. If you are new, grab one of those people after the meeting. There'll be a whole group of us hanging out. Grab somebody. We'd love to talk with you, get you some phone numbers, recommend some meetings for you. Are there any announcements from the floor for the good of AA? Anybody have anything going on? Nope. A couple quick announcements from this group. Uh, we do have a sister group, which is a big book study meeting. It meets right up the road. Uh, Thursday 7.30 at Salem UCC Church, that's 186 East Court Street in Doylestown, PA. Uh, the coffee for that meeting is on at 6.15, so again, feel free to come early and join us. We do have meeting lists and big books on easy terms. Please see me or any home group member after the meeting. If you cannot afford a big book, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group will give you one at no charge. Anyone willing to make donations for the purchase of big books and CDs to help those who cannot afford them can put their donations in that jar on the back table marked Big Book and CD Donations. All CDs are available free of charge. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have a YouTube channel. It's up over 400,000 view, uh, views now. Um, we post our speakers from this group on there. We also post speakers from a group we uh, have Monday nights at 6 p.m. in the room right next to here. It's a speaker step discussion group. Uh, we also have a Facebook page. Uh, we post our happenings, any, uh, obviously the upcoming speakers we have, any events, anniversary celebrations, workshops, as well as other groups in the area. We'll post things they have going on. So a good resource to have if you want to stay tied in with happenings and AA throughout the area. Um, and with that, I believe Nick is going to come up here. He's going to read our Just for Today prayer tonight. My name is Nick. I'm an alcoholic. Amen. Welcome home. The Just for Today prayer of recovery. Just for today I'll be agreeable. I will look as well as I can. Dress becomingly. Talk low. Act courteously. Criticize not one bit. Not find fault with anything and not trying to improve or regulate anybody except myself. And now with that I have Paul to come up and read, I'm sorry, Will to come up and read the preamble. Welcome home, everybody. I'm Will, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Alcohol Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. Now I have Paul to come up and read the 12 steps of recovery. Good evening, everybody. My name is Paul, and I'm an alcoholic. Thank you, Paul. Welcome home. These are the AA 12 Steps of Recovery. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. 
that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked Him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, <clears throat> made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for our knowledge of His will praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. Twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. And I have Brian coming back up. Okay, this group does have a seventh tradition. Every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. At this time, we'll see that the basket makes its way around. Uh, there are no dues or fees for AA membership, but we do have expenses, and your contributions do help us to cover the cost of food, rent, big books, workshops, and etc. so we do appreciate it. Uh, there's absolutely no smoking on the church property. It's the church's policy. We have a good working relationship with the church. Very lucky to be able to hold our meeting here, and they really just ask that we keep the premise clean, so be considerate of that as you're coming and going from the meeting. Uh, please take a moment to silence all cell phones and limit movement during the meeting to avoid distractions. And now to introduce our speaker for tonight, a good friend of the Conscious Contact Speaker Group on loan to us from the Working With Others Group. She came all the way from Virginia to be with us here tonight. Please help me welcome Mary. Hi, I'm Mary. I'm an alcoholic. As a result of the grace of God, the 12 steps, the 12 traditions, strong sponsorship, and an awesome home group, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink since March 30th of 2018, and for that, I'm truly grateful. Um, this is the last time I spoke in this area. I wasn't up this high, so for someone who, like all my life, I was always convinced any time I walked into a room that everyone was looking at me and everyone was talking about me. So I was always so nervous um, any time I would go into a place, and when I speak, it's overwhelming because everybody really is looking at me. So it just kind of freaks me out. But then I remind myself that it's not about me and it's about something greater than me. Um, my painful, dark past is my greatest asset, um, and that's all I focus on. So I, to go back, I didn't have a bad childhood um, at all. I was born in upstate New York in a place called Jamestown, and it was very small, kind of like a resort area. Um, I had two sisters and a brother, and my sisters were beautiful and popular, and my brother was a football player, and all the girls liked him, and then there was me. And the, I think the predominant theme throughout my life has been nothing is enough. Um, nothing in my life was enough, and I was not enough. And nobody ever told me that, that's just how I felt. Um, my family was very religious. Um, my mother was going to be a, uh, a nun, and my dad was going to be a priest. And they met at a wedding. Uh, my mother decided she wasn't going to be a nun when they told her she couldn't drive a car and smoke cigarettes. She said, I'm not doing it. And so they met at a wedding. My mom drank too much, threw up on my dad. And then it was love at first sight. Many years later, I came along. So it's like I started off from that. So, um, But all my childhood, I can remember hearing all about God. You know, it was always God this, God that. And my father would walk to church every day. And, you know, in my mind, it's like I wished that 
I really believed in all that. You know, it's like I wanted to, I thought it was a really good idea, but in my mind, I thought that it was something that people fabricated to try to have a reason for their existence. And I truly didn't feel like I needed one. So I kind of, you know, just went by the seat of my pants. Um, I was definitely, for someone who thought that they weren't enough along the same token, I thought that I was destined for something big. Um, something big, something great. I didn't quite know what it was. Um, so it's like I really was, you know, self-will run riot from, you know, conception. So in school, I can remember um, the first time I ever drank, it was, I think I was around eight. Um, I was at my grandmother's 80th birthday party. And there was, I was born in an Irish Catholic family, so drinking was kind of normal for us. But it's, I could always take a sip, that wasn't a big deal. Um, but on this particular occasion, I decided I was going to make my own. So it was a hot day, there was a carport, you know, in the back there was a pool. So I would go in and there were these things that were like brandy slush, it was like this like icy stuff and they put like ginger ale on top of it and it looked phenomenal and I made my own and um, I can remember that for the first time in my life my brain was quiet because it's like all throughout my life, like I told you, I walk in a room, it doesn't matter what it is, it's like my brain is going a million miles a minute saying, they're looking at you, they're talking about you, you know, do you look okay? And it's like for the first time in my life, everything was just quiet and I felt like, I no longer felt like I was less than everybody in there, but I felt almost as if I was better. I felt like I was the center of the crowd. Everyone wanted to be me, and they were laughing at me, and they thought I was cute, and I had arrived. It was something that I never, ever, ever wanted to live without. Um, and I think my life was trying to manufacture that feeling. Um, I had a friend back at home. Um, her name was Lisa. And her father was sick, and he couldn't, he could only stay on the first floor of their condo. So, and Lisa's mother had passed. So, um, I would go over to Lisa's house after school, and we would go upstairs or downstairs in the basement, and we would drink. And I would probably do that a couple of days a week, but then eventually it started to be one of those things where I was drinking every day, and I would drink at school. Um, I started drinking on a regular basis when I was 11. Um, my father owned a hotel and a restaurant. So um, there was really easy, readily access to alcohol whenever I wanted to because I could just get a master key and I could go in there. But it's funny because you know, from a young age, it's like I lived in this fantasy world where I would, like, create this story that I thought that other people wanted to hear about me that would make me acceptable or make me enough. So instead of telling people that my father owned a hotel and a restaurant, I said he owned a chain of hotel and restaurants. And then I used to take gymnastics lessons, so I told everybody I was training for the Olympics. You know, so it was like all of these fabricated stories to try to create this world that I thought that would make me good enough. Um, so, I, like I said, I started drinking at school. Um, I can remember one year, I think I was in the 10th grade, I got the lead in a school play. And they had asked me to be the witch, which I can't imagine why they chose me for that. But um, I knew everybody was going to be looking at me. So I got my dad's master key, I went into the restaurant, got a couple of beers, took them to school with me, and I started guzzling them in the bathroom at school, and then I threw out the bottles in the garbage can, and I went out there, and next thing you know, the principal comes out, and he says, listen, we found some bottles in the, in the bathroom in the garbage can, and, you know, we know who it is, so if you can come clean and be honest about it, nothing will happen. But if we have to come after you, then we're going to lay down the hammer on you. So for me, I never, never would tell the truth unless it was like for 
my benefit, you know. So if, if I'm going to get out easy, I'm definitely going to tell the truth. So I told the truth and got suspended. So my father, um, he was always my enabler, and my father showed up at the school and he lit them up. Um, what are you teaching this girl? You know, she came, she told you the truth, like, what are you doing? What are you teaching her? And so what I learned from that was I could manipulate people, you know, I, especially him, um, which is definitely something that I'm not proud of. But um, I drank all the way throughout high school, did well academically, and ended up getting into a pretty good school. Um, the school was known for football. So it was like a lot of tailgaters, you know, drinking like before the games and then passing out, not making it to the game. Uh, my senior year, I don't remember five minutes of my senior year of college. I don't remember what classes I took, don't remember who was there. Um, the only reason why I know that I graduated was because I have a diploma, but I know absolutely nothing about what happened. So what I did from there was I did what I normally do. And my MO is I'm going to do whatever's easy. You know, I, I, I'm so afraid of change. I'm afraid of people. I'm afraid of failure. I'm afraid of not being enough. So I'm going to manage, I'm going to manage a restaurant with a bar because that's what my dad did. And it was easy, but the dilemma with that is I also was very lonely and I never knew how to make friends. You know, my world was very small. I would find one person, like Lisa, make them my friends, suck the life out of them, and then they would end up not wanting to be my friend anymore, and they would hate me for some reason. I don't know what I did, but they would hate me, and then I would move on to the next person. So here I am. I have no friends, don't know how to make friends, but what I learned was alcohol could be very beneficial with that. So I would open up the bar of the restaurant, that I would manage, and we would drink after work. However, I think that my boss never really liked that too much because I went and got fired from one place after the next because obviously they thought that that's something that you're really not supposed to do. <laughs> so um, I ended up at this point in time, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. So I was drinking all the time. I was losing jobs, and, you know, I really wanted to be a good person though. You know, it's I really did. I wanted to be a good person. And my mother was sick, so I decided I was going to go home and take care of my mom. And that's what I really wanted to do. But the problem was I couldn't stop drinking. So I would I came home to help her and I just made matters worse. I was Drinking and going out to bars at night, coming home late in the middle of the night, waking everybody up, and it came to the point that this started to create um, discord in the relationship between my mom and dad. And I can remember my mother saying to my dad, she needs to go. Like, we can't have her here. She needs to go. You know, I'm going through enough. You need to kick her out. And my dad said, absolutely not. I'm not doing that. Like, I do not want my daughter to not be under my roof. I need to make sure she's okay. So my mom didn't have any choice. He gave me an efficiency room at the hotel with the master key just in case I was hungry to go get food at the restaurant. And um, that was not a good idea um, because what happened was my dad's motel became the after-hours spot. So I would go to bars at night. I would bring people home, we would party all, all night long, we would wake up the customers, we would make all kinds of noise, um, arguments, fights, like it was just horrible and my dad would try so hard to try to reason with me. You know, why are you doing this? We're trying to help you. Like you're so smart and you have so many things going for you. but. I didn't want to hear it. I was like, whatever, you know, I don't want to hear any of that. So all of a sudden one day I met this fantastic guy. You know, he was on the cover of all the local newspapers, usually with the caption of like most wanted. Um, 
he was nothing like my dad or my brother. Like, both of them were really, you know, clean cut, nice guys, like wearing suits, things like that, you know. But this guy was a hoodlum, you know, lived out in the streets, a derelict didn't have a job, so of course I said, come and stay with me. You can come and live with me. Bring your friends, as a matter of fact. You know, free room, you don't have, we don't have anything to pay for, all the alcohol we want. You know, you don't have to worry about anything. So he moved in with me. And that got to be really crazy because it was like, now it wasn't just the late night after the bar, now it's like all day long there was havoc going on. So it came to the point that I noticed this pattern with this guy. Um, he would get paid, and then all of a sudden he would disappear. Like four days, usually, he would just like disappear. I would have no idea where he was. He wouldn't answer any phone calls. And then all of a sudden he'd show up and he wouldn't have any money. Like not a dollar. And I'm like, what is that? Like, how does that work? We've got a free place to live, food, alcohol, like everything we need. Like, what on earth is this guy doing? So I was convinced he had another woman. And I am not going to allow that to happen after all I'm doing for you. So I decided I was going to follow this guy around. And it turned out not to be another woman, but another substance. So in my mind, I remember being like, you know, what could possibly be something that you would spend all your money on and, like, disappear for four days? Like, I don't even get that. And also, for me, it's like, from a very young age, because I felt like I was good and not good enough, it's like I always needed something external to me to make me feel okay. And at this point, it was you know, a, it was a human power. So it's like, I need this man to make me feel like I'm enough, and I'm gonna do anything to make sure I keep this man. So, of course, being a good girlfriend, you wanna share your boyfriend's hobbies, right? So I decided I was gonna try these hobbies, and Lord, that just brought everything to a totally different level. Um, I decided not to go back to the hotel anymore because that was an inconvenient thing. You know, it was like, I might only have two miles up the street. I don't want to do that. You can miss a lot, you know, in that amount of time. So I'm just going to stay here. And so I moved out into the street. Um, and my life just turned upside down. And then it came to the point where I said, you know, things aren't going well with this guy. You know, it just seems to me like I'm not a priority in his life. So I know what I'm going to do. I'm gonna get pregnant. Because if I get pregnant, there's like a double whammy here, right? If I get pregnant, this guy won't leave me because who's gonna, who's gonna leave somebody that's having their baby? Like, people don't do that. And then additional to that, I didn't wanna be doing these things that I was doing, you know? So I said to myself, if I get pregnant, I can stop. You know, it's gonna be the motivation I need to stop. So I think that this is the best idea. Well, that didn't work well either. So, you know, days would go on and like I wasn't eating, I was not sleeping. Um, my daughter, I could feel her in my stomach and I could fear, feel her like convulsing and going through withdrawal. Um, and I would swear, I would cry, I would pound my hand on the table, I would promise her, I would say, I'm not going to do this anymore. I promise you I'm going to stop. And I wanted to stop with everything in me. I just couldn't. A, I didn't know how to, but B, I just couldn't. You know, it, at this point, it was, it was a necessity. There was nothing that I could do. So I knew that I needed to support myself because living out in the street and being pregnant you know, and trying to support, you know, this lifestyle I had. I had to figure out how to support myself. So I met this guy, or a few guys, and they told me that they had a really good deal for me. They said that if I took a diaper bag for a baby that hadn't been born yet, and I would fill it up with some things, and then take the Greyhound bus, they'd take care of me. 
you know, they'd give me a place to stay, they'd make sure I had something to eat, and they would take care of me. And I said, absolutely. Like, that's the greatest deal ever. I'm going to do that. So I did that for a little while, and then unfortunately one night, um, I was probably seven and a half months pregnant, and the one thing that I can truly, truly say about my life in active alcoholism is that the reality of life that was in front of me was something that I could never, ever see. You know, it's like I would always have this lie or this notion in my head of what I thought was going on, and I would believe it. And at this particular guy's house, um, he was a Vietnam vet, he had PTSD, and there were guns all over the house. And I didn't notice it. I just never paid attention to it. I didn't see it. So he didn't like the deal that we had going on, so he pulled out a gun and started shooting me. So he shot me once in my, or twice in my chest and once in the back of my arm. It was in like the Buffalo area, so it was snowing. It was January and it was just snowing. So I ran outside, I had a cab out there waiting for me and I collapsed in the snow. Blood like pouring out of me and I sat there and it's like I, I said to myself, you're, you're about to die, you know, you're gonna die. So my A game in that moment was, you know what, I asked the cab driver to take me to a very sordid place because if I was going to die, I was going to die the way I wanted to. And that's exactly what he did. He took me to the most sordid place that he could find, and that's where I stayed. Um, never once did I consider the baby I was carrying. Never once did I consider my parents who would have to hear about this. You know, I considered absolutely no one. Next thing you know what, I wake up in an emergency room, and shortly thereafter, I was taken to jail. Um, it turns out that the um, gentleman who shot me, his brother was a police officer. So... I ended up spending a little time um, behind bars. And I would love to tell you that that's where everything changed and I got sober and life was fantastic, but that's not what happened. Um, I went right back out into the street. Um, and I continued to do that um, until I went into labor with my daughter. And so I'm in a sore place. I go into labor with my daughter. Someone has the common decency to get me to the hospital to deliver her. Um, and in my, it's like, there's always this gap for me in between my head and my heart. You know, it's like, I may know something intellectually, or I may, I may have an understanding of something intellectually, but there's nothing in here. So it's like, in my mind, it's like I could see my stomach getting big, you know, but I really had no understanding for the fact that I was having a child until I saw her face. And the minute I saw her face and I looked in her eyes, I said, oh my God, you're a mother. And I have absolutely nothing to offer her. I don't know how to take care of her. I don't know how to take care of me. I can't, I don't even know how to live at this point. I was reduced to be, to literally an animal level. Like, what am I going to do with this little human being? Like, I don't even know what to do with this. So I left her in the hospital and I went out into the street for a day. And then I said, no, I said, you got to do something. So I signed myself into a psych ward, turned my daughter over to child protection, and I went to get sober. Um, I ended up going to, I think it was a 30-day treatment program, and then they sent me to a six-month treatment program, and then I went to a halfway house after that. Um, lived, lived alone um, until I got my daughter back. And 
I think my motivation at that point in life was I just did not, I did not want to be the person that I was, and I wanted to be the mother that my daughter deserved. You know, I knew that my mother did her best for me. You know, I wanted to do that for my child. So that was my motivation. And I was going to, you know, at this point in time, I was sober for 15 and a half years. You know, is how long I actually stayed sober for. And to clarify, it wasn't that I was sober. It's not the sobriety that I know of now. You know, but I did not take a drink or use any minor mood altering substance for 15 and a half years. Um, in the beginning, I went to meetings, um, but there was always something that I was not willing to do. Everything was a negotiation for me. So they said, you know, things like get a sponsor. And I got a sponsor. But then she made me mad for one reason or another because I'm really good at that. You know, somebody will make me mad and then you're dead to me. So she made me mad and then I didn't want to have anything to do with her. And then I said, I don't need one of these anyways. You know, I can, I can do this on my own. I don't need to have a sponsor. And it was like little suggestions that they would give me, you know, like I remember them saying, don't get in a relationship. You know, um, you shouldn't get in a relationship because, you know, your picker's broken, broken, you don't have really good judgment. So, of course, I wasn't going to listen to that. So, I met this, um, this guy that had 10 years sober, and, you know, he was, everyone wanted to have something to do with him because he was so cool, and, of course, I had to have something to do with that. And the dilemma was he had five girlfriends, you know, one for each day of the week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I was Wednesday. And, but that's literally what I thought I was worth at that point in time. In my mind, I rationalized with that and I said, you know what, when he fi figures out how great I am, he's going to dump Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and I'm going to be the only one, but obviously that didn't work. So it was like, but that was like exactly what my recovery was. It was a bunch of half measures. You know, it was a bunch of, I'm going to do it my way. It was all self-reliance. And towards the end of that, like the last four or five years of that, I was a literal total nut. Um, I was miserable. I had so many things going on in my life because it's like at this point in time, it's I went on this quest where I thought that if I could make enough of myself, then somehow I could undo the embarrassment that I created of myself, and I would make all of these facts and truths about myself non-existent if I could make something great of myself. So I started to get all these degrees, you know, and I would get this degree, and then I would get that degree, and then I got this fabulous job, and they gave me this promotion, and then I wanted to get that promotion. So it's like, that's what my life consisted of. I had um, three kids at home, and my husband, and I was on a quest to try to, you know, prove to the world that I was enough, but I was still miserable. Like, I had all these things, and I was, inside, I wanted to die, but the, the outside of my life looked pretty fantastic. So I convinced myself that the reason why I was miserable was because I was fat. So I said, I know what it is. Like, you're fat. You know, and if you could lose some weight and look good, I'm sure you're going to feel better and you're going to feel like you're enough. So the dilemma was I needed my insurance to cover for me to have weight loss surgery because I want to have it the easy way. Like, I don't want to do things like the hard way. I want to do it the easy way. But I don't weigh enough for the insurance to cover it. So what I did was I went to Target and I got these weights. And 
when I, before I would go to the doctor's office, I would put like a 10 pound weight on one ankle, a 10 pound weight on the other ankle. I would go in and I would stand on the scale so I would weigh enough. And then they said, yes, you weigh enough that you can have this weight loss surgery. So I said, fantastic. So I got a proof of this weight loss surgery. I lost all this weight. And then it wasn't enough weight because nothing's never enough. So I decide that I'm going to have a revision to it. I had a revision to it. It worked. I lost a whole lot of weight. Forget about the fact that the doctor that did my surgery nicked my spleen and I had no immune system. Because for me, it was never about the negative consequence I may have. It was always about whatever it is that I was looking for, the effect. So it was like, the effect was I wanted to lose weight and that worked, right? So I have this done, I lost all this weight, but I'm still miserable. So I have everything in my life, like I got a husband, I got kids, I've got three cars, I got a great job, I got all this money, and I'm skinny, but I'm miserable. So then I said, you know what? I know what it is. I have all this skin hanging off of me from these weight loss surgeries. I think I need plastic surgery. That's what it is. I need a makeover. And that's like what was going on like on TV at that time was like the full body makeover shows. <laughs> so I said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. But how did I pick the person that I was going to use to do this full body makeover? I went on the internet because the reality is to spend that money on plastic surgery in the United States, that's pretty expensive, but you can get a really good deal in Mexico. And I found one, I found a plastic surgeon who could do plastic surgery on me for $9,000, including flight and a stay at the Hampton Inn. And I said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. That made complete and total sense. So I get on a plane thinking that that makes sense, not knowing a word of Spanish, I might add, I get off in Mexico City, there's this stranger holding up a sign that says Mary Culp, and I'm like, oh, so that's my doctor. I follow him, we can't even speak to each other, don't even speak the same language. He brings me to this like little backyard clinic place that he's gonna do my surgery. I remember him telling me just, you know, him and his wife, take off your clothes. They're like rubbing me down with iodine, laying me on this cart like you would see in MASH, like the show MASH. And 20 some odd hours later, I wake up totally cut up. But that was my A game. So I get back home and I'm thinking, I should be happy now, right? Like, no more skin, I'm skinny, I've got all these things in my life, like I've got these degrees that are going to make me enough, I've got this job with this title that's going to make me enough, and I was still miserable. So what now? All of a sudden, one day I'm at work, and somebody passed over a martini. And I looked at it, and I said, you know what? I think I was making too much of a big deal out of all that stuff. I don't think I'm an alcoholic at all. And I drank it without giving it a second thought. Probably for about, I don't know, maybe two or three weeks I was able to, you know, just drink on the weekend. But within short order, I was back to drinking every single day. And I ended up leaving my husband and children and moving out into the street um, because that's what I do. When people say that when you relapse, you pick up where you left off, that was not the case for me. Um, I picked up like I never stopped with 15 and a half years worth of power underneath me. And I was completely and utterly insane. And I moved back out into the streets and I left my kids and I left my husband and I left my job. 
and that's where I lived. It was about, there were probably, um, there were several times when I was out there that I would really, you know, it got to the point where I would really want help. Um, the only thing is, it's like I couldn't stay in that moment. You know, it would, it would something bad would happen, and I would say, you know what, I've got to change, I've got to change this, I've got to stop. And I'm like, you know, you know what you need to do because you got sober and you were sober for 15 and a half years, so you can do this again. So I would put myself into the local detox and I would go in there for a couple of days. They'd let me out I, and I'd go right back to where I was again. And what happened was I, would, I spent a good three, four years being in and out of treatment centers. Um, at first, it was in and out of detoxes, but then I was like, it was it was a bargain. I'm like, okay, so the detox doesn't work. They want me to do more. Oh, okay, I'll do the 30 day. Then it was I kept on doing the same thing with the 30 day rehabs. Well, okay, I'll do the I'll do the six months programs. So it was like all of this negotiation. But in the meantime, I had three children at home with no mother. I had a husband at home who was taking care of three kids on his own. And I didn't consider them at all. So it came to the point that I was in a six month program and I, you know, I had been going to Alcoholics Anonymous. I had gone into meetings from the age of 25. Um, and at this point in time, I'm in a six-month program. I have my sponsor. It's the same sponsor that I had had all along. She stuck with me. And we had gone through the first 164 pages of the big book twice. Um, but the problem with me is I couldn't grasp anything. You know, we would go through and I, she would read to me and I would listen to her and I would nod my head, but nothing would go in. It's like... I couldn't comprehend anything that she was saying to me. So I met this six month program and they're reading something in the book and all of a sudden it was like I had my first awakening and I called her on the phone and I said, this is all about God. She said, no blank, Mary. <laughs> and I was like, it never dawned on me. Like all this time I had no idea what, what this whole God thing was that they were talking about. So that was the first time that it's like I started to really understand the fact that there was more to this. I knew that the solution was here. I just didn't know how to find it. I didn't know how to retain it. I didn't know what to do. So it was, it was kind of difficult for me because I would get so far it's like I would go through these periods where I would have 30 days and then I would drink. And then I would have, you know, the more I would learn, the more I would stay around, the longer I could push that. You know, it would get to the five and a half mark, five and a half month mark, and I would go out. But it's like every time I would start to retain some more. Um, so I end up back in Richmond and I go into this sober living house and as soon as I walk into the sober living house I'm like I'm out of here I can't do this so I leave the sober living house and I go back out into the street and this time I was out in the street for four months I had a dress a pair of flip-flops and some underwear that I had on and I'm out in the street for four months in that same outfit, okay? It was towards the end of that four month period and it was my son's birthday. And I remember calling all day long, I was trying to get up enough money to get my son a gift. I wanted to get him something for his birthday and so I would go out in the street and do whatever heinous things I had to. And then as soon as I would get the money, I would drink, you know? So 
it's late at night, it's like 10 o'clock at night, and I call him on the phone and I'm like, you know, Justice, Mommy, so sorry, you know, I wanted so much to get you a gift, I promise you I'll get you a gift. And he says to me, I don't care about that. It's all I wanted was you. And I lost it. I can remember walking through the street, you know, and it, at this point it was, I couldn't live with alcohol, I couldn't live without it. There was nothing, there was no amount of alcohol that I could put in me to take away the pain of who I was and what I had become, and I hated myself. And so that, that, that particular night I was in a very sore place and I'm standing behind a door hiding um, from someone and I cry out to this God that I don't even know exists. And I said, whoever you are, whatever you are, please help me. So I ended up escaping that situation that night and I call somebody up from the program and I said, listen, I said, I need some help. And they said, we can take you to the local detox. And I said, you can't do that. If you take me to the local detox, I'm going to get out in four days and I'm going to do the exact same thing. I need more. Like, I, this is not going to be enough for me. So I didn't have any insurance. Like, most of the places that were around town, because I had been to so many things over and over again, nobody would let me come in anymore. So they took me to a men's homeless shelter in town and said, let's just talk to the director there, see if he has any ideas. So I go in and I see this director and he looks at me and he says, do you know that God loves you? And I lost it. The idea that someone could love me, because I certainly didn't. I hated myself and who I had become. And so he looked at me and he said, what do you think about going to, you know, this homeless shelter for women in Louisville, Kentucky for a year? You know, we can get you into this, this program. I said, I can't leave my husband and my kids for a year. And he's like, are you with them now? And I'm like, no. And he's like, all right then. So he packed me a big lunch. He put me on a Greyhound bus. And I can remember at that point in time, I was really, really delusional. Um, because somehow, in my mind, I was going to Kentucky. And is all I could think about was the Kentucky Derby. So somehow I thought it was like a horse farm. And it was going to be nature. And God, I deserve that. I deserve to be in nature with horses with everything that I've gone through. So when I got there, it certainly wasn't a, a horse farm. It was a very, very city. But I remember walking up to the building, and as I approach the building, I see this sign above the building that says, Welcome to a power greater than yourself. And I looked at that, and I was like, wow. You know, when I walked into that building, and... I was, and I always compare it to this, it was like I was pig, pig pen from the Peanuts. You know that character that has the dust cloud whirling all over them? You know, I had been in this homeless shelter for the first time in my life. There was no negotiation about what I was going to do. I was so desperate to become sober that no matter what they said to me, I was going to do it. So I can remember, you know, probably around the two-month mark, all of a sudden one day it's like I'm sitting there. There was this woman. She used to talk to herself every night um, and argue with someone that was not there. And I remember at first, like, really thinking to myself, you know, you don't belong here. You know, it's like, what are you doing in this place? Like, it didn't even dawn on me that I was homeless myself and I had the same dress, you know, pair of underwear and flip-flops. That's all I had to my name. But it's like, I always, you know, I'm looking at this woman and the dust settled. And I said, oh my God, I am just like her. 
You know, my excuse prior to this was always, you know, I think maybe I'm constitutionally incapable of being honest with myself, and it's not my fault, and I was, you know, I, I was just born this way. You know, it's not my fault. But for the first time in my life, I'm looking at this woman, and I'm like, there is no excuse, Mary. Like, there is no excuse at all. You know, you have the ability to do this thing. It's like, are you willing to do it or not? And that's what it all comes down to. So I'm going through these steps with this sponsor, and it's probably, I'm probably around close to three months sober. I'm on my fourth step. At this point in time, my mother um, calls me on the phone towards, you know, towards the end of, you know, me living in the streets the way that I was. My family um, had an order of protection out on me. Like, I couldn't contact them by phone. I couldn't come within 100 yards of them. Um, my father had been diagnosed with cancer. So my mother wouldn't let me speak to him up until this day. But this day, she calls on the phone and she said, listen, you know, hospice came in and they said your dad has four days left to live. So he needs to see you. And we're going we're gonna to give you a plane ticket and fly you back to Jamestown. So I get off the phone and I'm like, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to possibly do this? How am I going to stay sober, you know, with the loss of my dad? There were two things that ever made me feel like I was enough. One was alcohol. One was my dad. You know... Whenever I would feel like I couldn't do something, my dad would say I could. So how was I going to live a life without both of them? Like the idea of that was just something that I couldn't fathom. And I called my sponsor on the phone. I said, how am I going to stay sober? I don't know how I'm going to stay sober through this. And she said, Mary, it's not about you. It's about your dad. It's not about you, Mary. It's about your mom who's been married to him for over 50 years. It's not about you, Mary. It's about your children who haven't had a mother and are losing their grandfather. Go home and be of service to them. And that's exactly what I did. I got to go home and I got to spend the last four days of my life, or my father's life with him. Um, I had the opportunity to say to him all the things that I know that he needed to hear, but more importantly, the things that he needed to say to me. Um, all my life, my dad was my enabler. My mother was the one who just didn't put up with my crap, so I hated her. And my father used to always say to me, your mother's going to be your best friend, Mary Jo. Your mother's your best friend. And I was always like, I can't stand her. Like, that's not true. But my living amends to my dad, um, I looked to him and I said, Dad, I said, I promise all the love I have for you, I'll give to Mom. And he said, I knew I'd never even have to ask. And so my dad passed away, I was holding his hand, and it was just me and him. Alcoholics Anonymous um, gave me the ability to be there for my father when he needed me the most. Um, this man who took care of me my whole life and who cleaned up after me, I was able to be with him when he needed me the most. And that's a debt that I can never repay. When I it, well, it's interesting, you know, I was so scared at that period of time that I was going to want to drink. Like, what was the, what was the pain going to feel like? Was I going to be able to do that without drinking? And I can tell you, during that period of time, I felt a peace and a calm that I cannot explain. I felt like I was, I had a hedge around me, and I felt the presence of God. I can't explain to you how it happened. I didn't make it happen, but it happened. And no matter what was going on around me, I felt 
at peace. So when my family saw that I was able to stay sober at that point in time, they said, oh, she's healed. You know, she can go back home. It's a miracle. And I said, no, I said, I'm going back to this homeless shelter and I'm going to complete these steps with my sponsor. That's what I'm going to do. And so I did. Um, at the end of it all, I had to turn myself in. I had some legal charges. Um, but I wanted to do the right thing, so, and everything was just okay. You know, um, the one that I, thing that I can say is like, when it comes to the steps, I think one of the most profound things for me was when I did the four step, because like all this period of time in the beginning, you know, when I was doing the half measures, um, there would always be something that I would leave off the poor step. Um, and I would leave it off because I couldn't imagine ever telling anybody that about me. Um, somehow in my mind I thought that if someone knew that about me, they would never ever love me or accept me. Like, they would know the truth about me. I was so sick of Mary that I wrote this thing down on my fourth step and as we're doing it in the fifth my sponsor looked at me and she said did you say everything and I was like no and she said what didn't you say and I told her what it was and she said I bet it made you feel like and I was like that's exactly what it made me feel like and she said I had a similar experience and she explained something like that was kind of similar and for the first time in my life, I was able to look at somebody in the eye and really be okay with someone seeing me. You know, all of me. I didn't have to change anything about me. I didn't have to fabricate or tell a lie about who I was. So when I returned back home, it was like a lot of things were different. It was like, it seemed like when I left, it's like I hated everything around me, but I came home and I, rem I remember everything just seemed so good. And I remember saying, man, you know, like everybody's changed while I've been gone. And my sponsor said, no, you have. <laughs> and I was like, maybe so. Um, so it's like since that period of time, it's like there's been, there's been ups and downs. Um, one of the things that I know... Um, to be true, it's like, in 2022, I had a stroke. And it was directly related to some of the things I was doing in my body. So um, when I had this stroke, I lost vision in my eye, in the right portion of my eye. So from here up, I'm blind in this eye. And then it, these, this portion, this eye here and the, the bottom portion of this, the muscles are actually stuck in. So the doctor's telling me about this and says, like, this is the impairment, like, there's nothing we can do, there's no surgery. First comment Mary makes is, can you tell when you look at me? She said, what do you mean? I said, is there like a fog or something on my eyes when you look at me? And she said, no. I said, my eyes aren't pointed in or anything. And she's like, no. I said, oh, fine then. As long as I look okay, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be okay with that. So what happened at that point in time was, it was like there was question, like can she go back to work? You know, is she gonna be able to use a computer? I can't drive at night. You know, there's like a lot of like stipulations, but it was like, the, it was, the topic was brought up, like I don't know if you can drive. You know, I don't know if you can use a computer. Maybe you shouldn't go to work. Maybe you should go on a permanent disability. And as I was sitting there contemplating what that looked like, I realized how much still my life is reliant upon the things that I do and the approval of others. You know, it's like when I think about, you know, the spiritual life not being a theory, you know, and how important, you know, I think at that point in time, I really, really dug in in seeking my spiritual life. You know, I realized how important, you know, dependence and reliance upon God is. 
and everything really shifted at that point in time. Um, that's something that I, it's funny because it's like something that I think would be a horrible thing actually turned out to be the, the greatest blessing to me at that point in time. Um, because I've not been the same since that happened. Um, my life is pretty simple. Um, I spend my life really trying to, I have all my children in my life, everybody's great. Um, I can finally go to work and it can just be a job. It's just a job, I don't own the place, you know, I just, I just work there. Um, and that's okay. Um, I spend my life trying to help people. That's what I do. Um, my life is about being of service to other people um, and really seeking God um, on a daily basis. It's pretty simple for me. Um, thank you for allowing me to share tonight. I appreciate it. Okay. Good evening again, everybody. Brian, alcoholic. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Mary for coming out to our group tonight, delivering an incredible message of hope and recovery. Uh, a couple quick announcements. We'll wrap up the meeting here. As was mentioned, the Food and the Fellowship for this meeting starts at 8 o'clock every week. Feel free to show up early and join us uh, if you want to get involved in service with this group. We appreciate it. If you want to get involved with service right after the meeting, we could always use help putting the chairs away. But uh, most importantly, if you're new or if you're struggling, grab someone after the meeting. Like I said, we'll all be hanging out. Um, it's customary for us to thank our speakers. They do come here on their own time and expense, so usually we form a line in the front here and we thank our speakers personally. Uh, thanks to everyone for helping out with the meeting tonight. Thanks to our greeters, our readers. Thanks to Ms. Kay for taking care of the kitchen back there. And uh, most importantly, just thank our speaker, Mary, one more time. And, you, and if you do care to join us, we have a beautiful way of closing. We're going to circle up and uh, we'll close with our Lord's Prayer here. Close down the meeting with a uh, brief moment of silence for the still sick and suffering alcoholic inside and outside of these rooms, followed by our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, our Father. 